Coming up on this week's show, Google's free retro RPG. The Ocarina of Time sequel that we never got to play. And we chat to the father of Syndicate, Sean Cooper. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each week with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. Now check out their brilliant book, The Games That Weren't, featuring never-before-seen screenshots, pre-production art and exclusive interviews, delving into the mysteries of video games that never saw the light of day. You can check that out on their full range of retro gaming books on their website at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 286, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And welcome to the podcast that takes you behind the scenes on the world of retro gaming by speaking to the people that were actually involved at the time and made our childhood memories. And we've got an incredible guest on today's show. And before that, we're joined by our panel of alien bashing Platform romping, street fighting, joystick wagglers, the Retro Hour crew. And we're going to talk about all the stories that have been happening this week. When you started saying that, then I was like, who are they? (laughs) (laughs) You know, actually, I think, you know, all the things I mentioned then, you know, platform romping, all that stuff. The thing about us, I think we actually complement each other quite well because we've all kind of got our own areas of retro gaming that we're really into. I mean, if we're doing an adventure game episode, I'm totally in my element there. If it's RPG stuff, you know, Joe, it's all about you. Strategy games, you know, Ravi being the most intelligent of our crew, is all about the strategy stuff, aren't you, Ravi? I, I like the strategy games, but I can always get outplayed by anybody that's played it for longer because I'm not that good at them. But uh, yeah, you're right. Like especially when we get together and we, you know we're sitting down playing games, and uh, Joe will be like, "Oh, have you tried this one?" And you know he might pick a nice racer as well and stuff like that. And uh, it, it I, really... I tend not to pick the racers because I do like to smash you guys at games. And as soon as a racer usually goes on, that's where Dan usually gets a little bit better. I do like my me. racers. I do like my racers. That's, that's when we all get leveled out, isn't it? Like, <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm so excited about today's episode. Like, I just want to scream. Like, literally, we've ha- wanted to have Sean Cooper on the podcast since the very start. It was like, when we started this, this is one of the main guests that I wanted to get on. And he's an absolute hero of mine because he did Syndicate, which is just an absolutely amazing game uh, for Bullfrog Productions. And Joe will even remember the legendary Bullfrog Productions because oh, yeah, no, yeah. every game that they did was an absolute classic and uh, really was like genre defining. And mm. Sean was kind of under Peter Molyneux and worked in the company and came up with some of the ideas for some of these games and they were groundbreaking to think some of the stuff they were doing on like 16-bit computers is absolutely mind-bending. Because we've actually done episodes about Bullfrog before. I mean, we had Alex Trowers on the show um, not long ago, actually, started this year. Um, And then we had an episode with um, Glenn Corpus, um, all about mainly talking about stuff like um, Magic Carpet on that episode as well, um, a couple of years ago. So it's a company that we visited before, but Syndicate, and I know whenever we talk about, you know, your favourite games of all time, Syndicate's always in your top two or three, Ravi. Oh, yeah. Just even when I hear the intro music, I get goosebumps. It was like the first experience of true free roam for me, you know, like a living city years before GTA or anything, and you could walk around and people were doing their own kind of thing you could persuade random citizens to join your army and (laughs) go around and shoot cops oh it it was really good fun and uh all on the amiga or or on the atari you know it it was pretty amazing uh, amazing feat and like sean talks about glenn and alex as well and how the, the kind of programming and, and the speed of this game, because uh, it was an amazing achievement to have all these sprites running at the same time. Without his programming, it, it wouldn't have kind of come about. And, of course, games like Populous as well and uh, Power Monger. Yeah, Magic Carpet, which, you know, for me, I, I still remember, and I mentioned this in the interview, the first time I, I saw footage of Magic Carpet, I think it was on Bad Influence on TV, and I was just like, my jaw dropped. You know, I'd never seen, like, 3D scrolling graphics like that before in a video game and you know people forget because i mean we take stuff like that for granted so much now but then you know when these new 3d graphics cards were coming out it was such a massive jump wasn't it it was when the pentiums hit when the pentiums hit baby there was like um you know it was like mist mist for yeah mist for the cd-rom and then uh 
magic carpet for the Pentiums and you were like, oh my God, this is just mind blowing. And then Dungeon Keeper as well, which was an absolutely fantastic game. And I think that is the definition of like a, a game that defined a genre. The fact that it made people go out and buy new hardware to play the game. Yeah, which totally. those games obviously did. Yeah, so I'm um, going to be a really interesting guest going inside Bullfrog with the father of Syndicate, also touching on games like Populous, Magic Carpet, and lots more. Sean Cooper is going to be coming up on the show in around 25 minutes from now. Now, I hope that I don't sound um, too unprepared on this week's show. I must admit, I have spent the majority of this afternoon um, playing the new Google Doodle RPG game. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have uh, had a little play around with this. I've actually got pretty much a full-on JRPG and retro sports game all in one that lasts about four hours if you play it through. That is currently the Google Doodle this week on Google's homepage, of course, to celebrate the start of the Olympics. You know, um, it's it's interesting because I was actually looking at, at the google.com forward slash doodles and it has the whole history of the doodles and I remember there was that really good Pac-Man one. So um, maybe there's like a, you can find the old doodles on here and actually play them. Because the entire, the Olympics opening ceremony in Tokyo, that was really focused on video games, wasn't it? Yeah, they had like, a, I actually missed it. My wife's been watching the Olympics. Um, I've been with my wife 15 years and I've never really realised she's really into the Olympics. <laughs> uh, she's been getting up at like That's how much you pay attention to. Yeah, <laughs> she's been getting up at six in the morning to watch the diving and I was like, oh yeah, all right, watch the diving. I see how it is. But yeah, um, she was saying and a friend of mine was saying, you know, they had like Soul Calibur, Kingdom Hearts, Final Fantasy, Chrono Trigger, um, you know, loads and loads of, you know, big Japanese games, but games that hadn't, you know, Chrono Trigger's not had a release in years and years, you know, mm. um, you know, that just a huge celebration of like Japanese culture. You um, know, the bit that it was in, it was in when they walk around and they wave the little flags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, each country comes through and they go, oh, the great British team. And then, yeah. you know, each one comes through and they were playing it in the background and like, yeah, it's amazing to hear this music and uh, a bit of a hint there as well. Uh, Soul Calibur. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, something, oh. something coming up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the one thing that was really weird is even though, you know, we've got Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020, there's actually an official tie-in game. There's no Mario or Sonic music apparently anywhere in it, which is a bit of an oversight, I think, but <laughs> there you go. So, so <laughs> That's quite it, funny, actually. <laughs> one thing, like you played this Google Doodle and you played yeah. it for like, it, it, is it still available? And, how long did you end up playing it? It must have been a big kind of RPG if you can play it for that long. Well, it is. I mean, apparently, I haven't played it all the way through, but the way it works is it's kind of like um, graphically, it's kind of reminiscent of something like the Game Boy Advance. So it's not kind of like really old school, like, you know, NES style graphics. It's, I, would, I would put it on par with SNES RPGs. Yeah, like yeah. Kind of like Final Fantasy VI kind of look. Um, I, I only played it for like five, ten minutes before we started um, because of... I, I, I've been really busy recently. I've not been able to get on a desktop computer. Um, and um, I only played it for like five, ten minutes. So I didn't actually get to the RPG bit. I was just doing the ping pong bit at the start. Right, yeah, yeah. But it was really <laughs> fun. And I was like, yeah, I want to keep playing this. But we started what, what, recording. So do, you, do you play through like the Olympic challenges and all of the little games? Yeah, so there's there's two elements to it, really. So you've got like a, an RPG with like, you know, NPCs that you talk to as well. And there's a lot of kind of um, Japanese mythology in there as well. And there's um, different like quirky versions of Olympic sports that you've got to beat. The, none of them are like, you know, straightforward. They're all, they're all kind of weird spins on them. But yeah, so really you do the RPG elements and then you come across sporting areas where you've got to compete in challenges. So it's kind of a mixture of like a retro sporting game and a JRPG, really. That's pretty mad, and it must have been coded probably in JavaScript if it was there uh, on the Google Doodle. The Google Doodle. It's not going to be um, Flash <laughs> or anything like that, is it? <laughs> oh, no, it runs any. I mean, you can run it on mobile as well, um, but I, obviously you need to use keys by default, but you can actually configure it to work with a controller. And I know that some people have been doing um, speed runs of the challenges on Reddit. I think one guy's got the world record on there. He did one of the challenges in about 14 seconds. Oh, wow. Um, wow. There's the got to be day. Easter eggs in there as well. You know, that people will find them. Yeah, there's a bunch of collectibles and stuff that you've got to get. And apparently there's like, you know, about 30 different events that you can take part in, like, you know, kind of um, different quests that are in the game when you finish the sports. Uh, but yeah, some people reckon if you play it right through, on average, it'll take you around three and a half to four hours. So this is really, I mean, 
it's a full game. I was going to say, it's, it's a bit bigger than Pac-Man. Yeah. <laughs> on the old Google Doodle. But yeah, it, it's it's only going to be on for a week and it came out on Sunday. So when this episode comes out, it'll only be out for a couple more days. But I'm sure they'll archive it because I'm sure you can go black, like Ravi was saying, you can go back and play the old ones. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just looking now on uh, Google.com forward slash mm. doodles and they've got like so many of the old ones and loads of games that I didn't know are actually existing, like snow games and uh, New Year's Eve games that they had and uh, Valentine's Day ones and like interactive things. But this one seems like the kind of biggest so far and, and the most suiting to our podcast, I'd say. It's even got stuff like, you know, um, anime style cutscenes and stuff in there as well, which, you know, for like a game that's just there, you know, as a bit of a novelty before you search for a website. Um, yeah, very fully fledged. I mean, a lot of people are saying, you know, they could release it and it could be an indie game that people are buying on the Switch or something easily. But obviously, I think, yeah, you're right. They're going to archive it, I'm sure. I mean, they wouldn't go to all that effort to, you know, make their biggest Doodle game so far and then delete it after a week, I wouldn't imagine. Well, well I, Dan- I, I've just gone on Google Doodle Games and clicked on Pac-Man and Pac-Man has just started blaring out the <laughs> computer. I was like trying to X it off it, like, what? <laughs> Well, Dan did a video recently about the um, internet in in the 2000s and um, the Google, we remember when it was just a static image that just said yeah. Google yeah, in those different colours. Yeah, it's uh, come on quite a long way since then, but um, I think you're right as well, Joe. That's one thing just to be aware of, you know, if you are working back in an office or something right now, a lot of these games do play audio, so don't get busted while you play them. <laughs> <laughs> Loads of people loving it. That would definitely be me. <laughs> it's true, actually, because Google is going to be one of the only sites that would be allowed through on some workplaces so having a game on it oh god that's that's a distraction isn't it do you know i remember hearing back in the day that like there was a statistic of how many hours of productivity were lost in offices all around the world because of people playing solitaire on windows 98 oh, and god. i imagine how how much is going to be lost on this four hour rpg game <laughs> a what lot, level a lot. are you on <laughs> yeah i was gonna say a lot of people will probably go back and speed run it and stuff as well like you say now, of course, the Nintendo Giga Leak is um, a subject that we've been revisiting on this show um, pretty much nonstop since it got released. Again, we always have to do this little disclaimer. We don't endorse the way this stuff got out there, but it is damn interesting to look into it. Now, we did talk about this um, on the podcast about a year ago, I think, when it was first kind of mentioned that there was some code in there about an, you know, an, an assets actually, about an unreleased Zelda game. And now there's some more information that's come out, and um, I'll link up the article on Gaming Bible in our show notes and this looks like a lot of people say it looks like it could be an ocarina of time sequel that never got made yeah this is quite interesting so this is like you say it's from the uh big leak last year and uh, a twitter user user joshua goldie has translated this for us um and essentially in 2006 there was development you know for a zelda ocarina of time sequel we're assuming it was a sequel to Zelda Ocarina of Time because it was based on one of the characters in Ocarina of Time called Sheik um I'm yeah. not too sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly I love Ocarina of Time massive massive fan but obviously I think it is Sheik yeah. I'm, <laughs> it's one of those get you read it obviously there's no audio um no dialogue in that game you have to read it all and stuff it's one of these games I played as a kid so I've always known her as Sheik um where you play as the character Sheik and you play in essentially an alternative reality where Link didn't stop Ganon Right. Um, which I think is really interesting. So a kind of, essentially you play a sequel to Ocarina of Time if Link didn't save the world, essentially. Like the bad ending. The bad ending, yeah, which yeah. I think is really cool. And this was in development in 2006. Now, in terms of development, there's only concept art, which was in pre-production by Retro Studios, which is really cool. I would have liked to have seen that, but it might have been difficult because of, like this article is saying, because the Majora's Mask is pretty much the sequel to Ocarina of Time. So how would it have worked? But I think that's quite easy for it to have worked because they're saying it's the alternative, like it's if if Link didn't win. So it's, it was it's, up to, it's, it's a new kind of, kind of time. Yeah, it's a new timeline. So like when I when I watch Star Trek, there's always new timelines and different yeah. continuation. And I'm sure Zelda fans might be ripping their hair out, going, "Oh God, another one!" And, yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. Try to document it all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because there is so many different timelines and stuff in the, the you know the Zelda games anyway. But it's interesting that they didn't go ahead with it. But I mean, maybe because of Twilight Princess was at 2006 as well. And, you know, we had a lot going on with Zelda, a lot of IPs coming out for Zelda. But, you know, or it could just be the fact that, you know, Ocarina of Time is kind of regarded as one of the highest rated games of all time. You know, on Metacritic, mm. it's 99 out of 100. Maybe there's just that fear of like making a sequel to it because of 
even though Majora's Mask is kind of a sequel to it, it, there's a story there, which I won't go into too much detail about how, I can't remember the name, the ins and outs of it, but essentially they wanted to develop a new Zelda game and they did it using the Ocarina of Time assets and then that's kind of why it became the sequel to it. Whereas mm. this would have been a different situation because it was like eight years later and, you know, we were on the GameCube and the Wii was coming by this point. But for me, that sounds like a really cool con- like game concept. And people are saying as well, because obviously we've had like, you know, Skyward Sword HD, mm. um, and, you know, with Zelda's 35th anniversary, you know, people are saying that there's rumours of more remasters of old school Zelda games coming before the end of this year. And it would be cool if, I mean, w- what the chances are of Nintendo actually having kind of a, a ready to go version of this in the archives or something that maybe they could release. But interestingly, when I read this story, I did a bit of digging down on the the thread on the original tweet and someone linked up um, an interview with Miyamoto back in 2016 okay. where he said they, they definitely do want to do a game based around Sheik. Oh, wow. Okay. Saying. So that was kind of something that they weren't adverse to doing. Yeah. Obviously, that was like five years ago now, but, um, you know, maybe that will happen at one point, but... Yeah, I wonder what they'd call it because of it, it's all coming back to me now. Sheik is Zelda. <laughs> in yeah. Ocarina. So what was the Legend of Sheik? Would they call it? <laughs> it's a hard one. Just makes me think of the seventies disco band. Yeah, exactly. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, d- definitely would have been pretty cool if they went ahead with it, or really, really cool if it turned out they have you know been developing it and then they just kind of drop it like here, here's a new, here's a new Zelda game. But they're already doing Breath of the Wild too, aren't they? So. I can't see that. But that is, one, that is one thing about Nintendo, though. Often they are quite good at keeping their, you know, development secrets, apart from the Giga League, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but, you, know, you, know, you know, things that they're working on, though, they often do surprises sometimes, don't they? And just yeah, like, oh, true. Done this. So, um, yeah, it could be interesting. We'll, uh, we'll link up that article if you want to check out everything we know so far in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, what about this? A game from 1993 that is still getting new content made for it. Of course, I'm talking about Doom. I was the original about Doom. to say it's got to be Doom. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. It's always Doom. Well, this is Bethesda, who have actually released new free content for the original Doom and Doom 2. This is pretty cool because they, they bought id Software. Uh, they, yep. they kind of bought up all the rights, and we covered that last year, where they um, bought loads of rights of different companies. And uh, it seems really cool that they're actually, you know, introducing this... Uh, mod and add-ons uh, for doom like officially and uh, i saw that the guy had made a uh, his name's james paddock he'd, he'd previously made some midi uh, on wads and provided the soundtrack for uh, john romero's sigil as well mm. so he's kind of got a history of being within the doom scene and uh, also being a big john romero fan so yeah so the, these maps coming from jimmy paddock they are they're mods of Doom 1 and 2, aren't they? That he made, like, in... Yeah, yeah they're, they're like, just not WAD files, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, made them, he made them quite a few years ago. He made them in, like, 2000 or something, but they've scooped them up and put them out as official releases, haven't they? Well, this is, I mean, there was a big add-on called a Deathless that a lot of people know, um, mm. if you're a Doom fan. And these are kind of the uh, spiritual successor to that, and there is currently 12 of them out there. It's kind of an in-progress mega WAD that you can download for free. Um, called Earthless Prelude. Um, and again, yeah, this, this guy James, he started making these maps when he was a teenager back in 2003 just to kind of get a feel for how Doom Wads kind of work. You know, he designed a lot of them. There's actually a really good interview with him on uh, the Slayers Club part of uh, Bethesda's website. Um, Multi page interview, loads of graphics and stuff in there too. But he kind of shows you a bit of how he worked it out, all on um, <laughs> proper old school on graph paper. He oh, hadn't wow. drawn these with a biro. <laughs> so it kind of shows you his working out process. And he said what he did, he, he made these back in the early 2000s when he was a teenager. And he had them all saved, but they weren't very good. So what he's done is he's kind of used them as a foundation to kind of make these new wads, you know, polished them up and improved a lot of the ideas that he had back then. Um, obviously, it's taken him nearly 20 years to do this. So a lot of effort and love has gone into this. But yeah, I mean, from what I've seen so far, I haven't downloaded these, but apparently they are available now, the, the preview version of it for free. They're if on, you want to check it's it on out. Switch, Xbox and PS4 as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's good from the I game menu. So yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give that a, give that a try um, this weekend, definitely. But um, from you know the graphics I've seen in the videos so far, yeah, these look fantastic. If you're a fan of the original Dooms, I mean, just getting new content for them because obviously those are two games in terms of downloadable content, there are so many different maps and mods and everything out there for Doom. People love the storyline. Like, yeah. I, I think this is why a lot of people do it as well, because they love telling the story of Doom and, like, Doom 2. And, you know, this one's going to be a prelude as well. So, you know, um, it, it's really fantastic. And it just shows that kind of decent level design can still shine through. 
Yeah, and like you said, he's got a bit of a background in the MIDI scene as well. I mean, at the moment, it just kind of uses uh, music from Doom 1 and 2, but apparently he's going to be working with, you know, some famous Doom MIDI designers, you know, in the community to get some new music made for this when it's finally ready to be, you know, full finished release as well. So, uh, yeah, ve- very exciting. I mean, it, it's just a game that I think, it's a game that's never going to go away, isn't it? The original Doom. Yeah, it's it like is, a virus. It's I was, about, I was going to say, it's like a virus. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty timeless, you know, and I think people always just come back to it as like, oh, yeah, it's Doom, it's the original. Like, you know, I mean, no, it's not the actually original, but, you know, it's the first big first person shooter. So I think, like you say, you know, I, I recently played through Doom 1 and 2 and I was thinking about like how I was going to show my daughter this when she was older and just be like, oh, yeah, this is like, you know, the best one kind of thing. You'll run it on like your, um, your little display on your fridge or something in a yeah. couple of years. Just, just getting a can of coke out. Look, I've got this. <laughs> She's done everything else right now. She's just not bothered. <laughs> you know, I was thinking then about how many different platforms I've got Doom on. I wouldn't be surprised if pretty much every console that I've had for the last 25 years has got some version of Doom on there. I'm trying to think right now. The only console I can think of is probably the Mega Drive. But then again, that's like 32 years I've got oh, it on the 32X, was, yeah, yeah. actually. Oh, you yeah. got 32X. There you go. I was wrong. <laughs> That's, that stands next video. Can I get run, Doom to run on everything that I own? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all at once. <laughs> Running on my car radio when I'm driving down the motorway. In a huge lab. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Doom, legendary game, never going to go away. And obviously, we love seeing all these new developments for it as well. Now, what about this? Something I always wanted to own as a kid was a robot hand. Sorry, it just reminds me of uh, the Big Bang Theory with Howard and the robot hand when you said that. I've never seen that. You've got to film me in. I don't, oh, know, God. I don't know either. No, too rude for the podcast. <laughs> right, I thought it might be something along those lines. Now, the reason I wanted a robot hand is after seeing Short Circuit, the first movie. The guy in there, he's got a robot hand, then he actually flips someone off with the robot hand. And after I saw that, as like a six-year-old kid, I was like, oh my God, I've got to have a robot hand. Or, or the Terminator hand. I was going to say it was yeah. Terminator 2 for me. So what about this? A robot hand that can play Super Mario Brothers. Now, this sounds like something out of Terminator. They're getting too clever for me. It's pretty clever. It's definitely beyond me. I watched the video on it earlier on. It's not quite as scary as it sounds. It's not like AI. It's like previously programmed. But essentially, I I don't want to make anybody mad, but they're using soft robotics where kind of the robotics are kind of, they use water and air pressure. Yeah, it, squishy it, robot hands. It squishy looks robot like, hand, uh, yeah. It's like you know, a squishy pneumatics, robot hand. Yes. Pneumatics work with oil. It looks yeah. like these are little kind of bags of fluid that get filled up really quickly and then act but it looks, like but it's the a joints yeah. on, on the fingers. Yeah, that's that pretty much it. And this, you know, it's it's all 3D printed. And it's all based on biology as well, um, which is, you know, like you say, like the pneumatics and stuff, and it fills with fluid and stuff like that, which is really, really cool. But essentially, it uses different levels of pressure from the water and air that fill it to control the D-pad. So just pressing right on the D-pad and then the A and B buttons on the NES controllers. Um, And then they pre-program it on a computer to then run the pressure on the hand to then play the game. And obviously... It doesn't just run straight into a Goomba. It like plays the first level perfectly because it's been programmed to do that way. So it knows when to jump at the right time and you know and when to move forward at the exact time and stuff like that. Because obviously the level always plays the same on the first, you know, on Mario. So it always mm. plays the same. It always knows when the Goombas are coming and everything like that. Um, but it's still super super smart to watch and then see this like robotic hand playing it (laughs) yeah if if somebody was disabled and they kind of lost their hand or something and uh, they could get a robot replacement uh this maybe could be uh something that could help you know uh have a more kind of sensitive yeah and i think you know uh, rather than just a johnny five kind of really yeah i I am i imagine that's probably the end goal you know with the whole you know, if you watch the video, they explain what soft robotics is, and that's kind of where they're trying to go with. When you think robot, they literally say you think the Terminator, you think C three PO, you think Short Circuit, Johnny Five. That's it. You know, it's in the video, like like Dan just said. But they're actually trying to go soft robotics because it's it's more comfortable, it's more biological. Yeah, and, it's and obviously it seems, not biological, but it feels more biological. It and it seems biological. a lot less. Um like aggressive like uh, compared to a nintendo player who would be playing a competition you know with mario or doing a speed run really fast or something it's not going to compete with that but it's 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 got a, a kind of realism that that yeah uh, 
you know, yeah, other absolutely. hands I haven't seen. So I guess what they've got to do is then um, the programmers have to kind of, I guess it's trial and error. And they just program in the exact points that the, the hand has got to move. Yeah, to, that's what it looks like yeah. they've done. Yeah. You know, like, like I say, it's not AI or anything like that. That was my first fear. I was like, <gasps> kind of thing. <laughs> like it's playing Nintendo. Um, but no, it, it's programmed in. And I imagine either it's trial and error or you might be able to, I would not be surprised if there's videos or data online where you can just pull it where it's like, to have the perfect run, you need to press left for free, you know, right for three seconds, then press A, then press right for three seconds. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah. AI is also learning video games at the moment. So we covered before Google. Yeah, we have Mind covered it before, there was, yeah. There was learning it. So if you could maybe hook this up with some AI, but I think this would probably be a lot better with a human mind and and, and kind yeah. of being into, able to interface it with that and uh, uh, give someone the ability to play retro games that hasn't been able to yeah don't give them ideas about linking it up to uh (laughs) (laughs) skynet yeah ravi's gonna be diffused to him in child (laughs) the day i'll be impressed is when it can beat rob the robot or jaramite there you go impress me yeah (laughs) Yeah. until they do that we're not impressed (laughs) now speaking of mario of course i mean one of the most legendary platform games of all time and something that sold a lot of nes consoles back in the day because on the pc it wasn't something that could easily be emulated, of course, until id Software got involved. Now, of course, we um, saw their platform game Commander Keen that was a revolution in terms of, you know, scrolling PC platform games. Nobody had seen it done like that before. But actually, it was originally going to be a Mario port to the PC, as we know when we had John Romero on the show and you interviewed him, Ravi. But now the actual port that they did to the MS-DOS PC has been found in a stack of discs that are now in a museum. It's amazing because they never released this because they were scared of getting sued by Nintendo all those years ago, and yeah. they still didn't release it. Like, John Romero put a video out in 2015 of it, but he didn't release the game or anything, so they were still kind of worried about Nintendo. So it shows how dominant Nintendo has been about their IPs and kind of, you know... Uh, a port that that, that that was pretty much unofficial and, and not done with permission. I, I, I love that they were so terrified that the disc just got mixed in with a load of other discs and just accidentally given away, though. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <That's> <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we all remember what happened with them, the great Gianna sisters, mm. you know, when that game came out and it got pulled off the shelves oh, as yeah. well. Yeah. So we, even something that kind of, you know, resembled Mario, I guess it kind of had to change Commander Keen so it, you know, it, it couldn't be in a court of law. They couldn't say, yeah, this is direct a rip off of Mario because it did look very different. Um, but yeah, you watch this and it is um, Super Mario Brothers 3, isn't it? The PC prototype from id Software. And there's a little video as well that you can check out in the, the PC Gamer article they've embedded. And it does play very similar to the NES version in some ways, I think, you know, graphically, it looks a bit better. Well, this was the display of John Carmack's programming, wasn't it? It was it was, it was, was really the display of his kind of smooth scrolling because uh, the legend was that this could never be done on the PC. The PC could never kind of hit the levels of the consoles. And uh, he totally kind of disproved that. And then they went on to do Doom, of course, which we've covered as well. But, uh, yeah, it's amazing that this has actually come to light now. Yeah, and I think it's, um, obviously this was shown off like years ago, and I think we we might mention it in the very early episodes of this podcast, but having it now in a museum where I guess, I mean, I don't know if they're putting this on display or people can go along and actually play it. If they do, I can't imagine it'll be long until it kind of leaks onto the internet. I don't know, the template or anything. It might get dumped now that it's out there. uh, Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, Unless Nintendo come to the museum. Accidentally (laughs) dumped, even though the museum have got a hold of it. (laughs) (laughs) What's that? What's that thing it says in Jurassic Park? Life um, finds a way. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, might end up out there somewhere. But yeah, very cool. And just to see that, I mean, like like I said, we've seen that video before, but it would be amazing to actually sit down and get to play something that's just so legendary. Well, the there, there was that um, C64 uh, Mario as well that came out, wasn't there? And then that kind of disappeared quickly, but uh, everybody still has a copy. So, you know. Gianna Sisters, yeah, I've got it on my, uh, pretty much my SD cards every, and all my, you know, old Commodore machines. I've got a version of that on somewhere. Right, so, Dan, um, I'm calling Nintendo now. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo hotline. <laughs> yeah, my door gets broken down just before we finish this week's episode. You know why? Now, of course... 
The weather's been really warm here in the UK recently. Uh, we've all been working long hours as well. Maybe you're looking for something to help improve your brain performance. I think it's fair to say all us guys could do with that from time to time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> Bit of extra focus and memory. Well, this is, let's give a big thank you to this week's sponsor, our friends at Sun's Brain Health. Now, if you head onto their website, suns.co.uk, obviously the brain is the most complicated organ in the body, which you know everyone knows about as well. But apparently your brain uses around 15% of your blood and oxygen supplies to generate all of those signals, despite it only amounting to 3% of your overall body weight. So, you know, sometimes you get to the end of a long day, you get a bit of brain fog and stuff, because your brain does work really hard hard all throughout the day. And Sun's Brain Health Supplement contains nine natural ingredients that can improve the way your brain performs. And it does this by providing your brain with vitamins and minerals it needs to thrive, improving circulation within the brain as well and allowing for more efficient neurological signals. So I've been on these for a couple of days now. I think you guys will agree. And after talking to me, sounded pretty sharp in this week's episode. You always sound sharp, but you do sound particularly (laughs) sharp today, Dan. (laughs) (laughs) On it today. But listen, we want to give a big thank Thank you to our Sun's Brain Health for supporting the Retro Hour podcast. And actually, if you use our code RETRO25, you will get £25 off your first order. So check them out right now, improve your brain performance and help out the podcast by heading to their website, suns.co.uk. Now, every week on the show, we give a big mention to a retro gaming shop of the week. Now, these are video game stores all around the world that are keeping the retro cores alive. You know, the place you go maybe on a Saturday afternoon to browse around the retro consoles they've got in, maybe pick up games at a better price and better condition than stuff you get off eBay. And we want to keep these independent shops thriving. So every week on the show, we offer to advertise your local favourite retro gaming shop for free. And this week, we're going to go to a shop called The Retro Hunter in Leon C. Yeah, we got contacted by Jonathan Quilter, and he says, uh, Excellent episode, guys. Oh, thank you. Um, Not sure if you've already featured it on the previous episode, but my local retro gaming shop also has an arcade next door, which is a pretty big bonus. It's on Leon C in Essex, which is basically next to South End on C. Uh, The owner, Ali, is really friendly and knowledgeable with a selection of games, consoles, and retro toys. And the arcade is known as Neon Knights as well. Um, and it's got free entry with all the, uh, an entry fee with all the arcades uh, free to play as well. Uh, now, I've, as usual, I've bought up some images of the store. And, you know, I've actually heard of this one before because they're always talking about this on um, RGDS. And uh, I think Ali, the retro hunter himself, is, is quite a big guy on the retro collecting scene in the UK. I was going to say, this shop looks pretty pristine. Um, and the way the games are displayed, there's some pictures here of like the Super Nintendo games for sale. And the way it's displayed is as if a collector, somebody passionate has done this. Not to say that other shop owners aren't passionate or anything like that, but it just looks like somebody's collection. <laughs> but obviously it's in a shop for sale. We've been to retro gaming shops where they're literally stacked floor to ceiling. Yeah. And I've pulled those over before those displays. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, the amount of secondhand shops and stuff like that I've been to and they have a retro good bit and they are, like you say, they're just on the floor and stuff like that. But this, you know, this looks like a really nice little beautiful shop, um, which, you know, looks really reasonably priced as well. They've got a CDX on for sale there. They've got Sega Saturn, Atari 2600. And also, which is pretty cool, is they take all board games and retro toys from the 70s and 80s and 90s as well, which is awesome. I love the fact they've got a um, Mega Drive and Mega CD original display cabinet here as well. Yeah, man, that's Um, awesome. That looks amazing. I've never seen that. Yeah, that looks absolutely gorgeous, doesn't it? I do remember seeing those in like Future Zone and stuff back in the day or Electronics Boutique. Yeah, probably Future Zone actually in the mid-90s. Yeah, those really cool displays with a nice little CRT monitor in there. And uh, yeah, that's very nostalgic to look back on. But I think, you know, we mentioned last week, I mean, the shop that we covered last week was again another retro gaming shop with an arcade twinned onto it. So it does seem like this is a bit of a trend at the moment, but a really good idea, I think. Yeah, so check check them out, uh, facebook.com slash the real retro hunter and also Neon Knights, which is neonknights.co.uk. And also, I, I heard that there's a Wimpy still going in South End on oh, Sea. Wow. So we need to go down there. Arcades. I was going to say, Wimpy. that sounds right on Bravi <laughs> Street. <laughs> oh, heaven. <laughs> yes, yeah, so people who don't know, Wimpy was like, um, for those outside the UK, that was kind of on every high street in Britain, wasn't it, back in the 80s? The original and early kind 90s of before. burger, burger joint, yeah. 
And you get a knife and fork and you sit down with your plate and eat it. You don't get it in a bag. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. You know, I read that when Brad Pitt comes to the UK, he's a big fan of Wimpy and he always tries to hump one out apparently because he loves it the that much. The man's got taste. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. That's convinced me that we need to make a trip there. Retro Game Arcade and Wimpy straight after. Come on, what could be better? So definitely check them out and get in touch with your favourite retro gaming shops as well. We'd love to give them a mention on a future episode, show at theretrohour.com. Now, of course, this podcast keeps coming out each week thanks to our incredible patrons. Now, we have said before, the Retro Hour is not owned by a big media company. There's not a big publishing group behind us or anything like that. Literally three retro gaming nerds who sit in our spare rooms, record the show each week, and we are fortunate enough to chat to some of the biggest names in the industry and bring this podcast out for you each week. And I've got to say, you know, now that we've been doing this podcast for almost 300 episodes, you know, five and a half years we've been doing this for now, this is like, you know, not that it's a full-time job, but it's like a dream job, isn't it, doing the show? It is a dream job doing this. And, you know, and it's nice because it is like a hobby that's become a job. And it's a hobby that started out that we kind of had to pay to do ourselves. You know, it's surprising how much that it actually does cost to run. Um, but I was actually launching the Patreon and it being as successful as it has been because of our fantastic listeners. You know, it it just, it's like a relief. It's like that pressure off our back that we can, that it makes it a hobby again. Do you know what I mean? Rather than it being like, oh my God, I need to pay for this and pay for that. Like it it just makes it so much easier for us. So it it, it is always from the for heart when we say this. Yeah, you know, if, if one week Joe spills a, you know, kind of strongbow <laughs> into his mixer, then <laughs> we can always get a replacement because, you know, our patrons help us buy all the kit, they help us pay for the hosting and everything that needs to go into doing a podcast every week. And we hugely appreciate it. Honestly, we kind of, kind of you know, I don't think we can stress how much we appreciate your support. Um, and of course, for supporting us on the podcast, we're not all take, take, take. We give back as well. You get access to loads of stuff if you back us on Patreon, don't you, Ravi? Yeah, you get the retro hours after hours, which is our kind of behind the scenes late night episode where, you know, it goes on for about oh, definitely over an hour. And uh, we get all... Sometimes closer to two, I think. Yeah, we get all nostalgic on that and uh, come up with a lot of memories. And uh, we recently did one on the SNES, which was quite good, actually, because we all had different experiences of that system. Um, You also get, like, extra perks, like a T-shirt and stuff like that, depending on your level. But also, you get to join us for the patron meetups. And the patron meetups are fantastic. You basically all get together we've got a nice little community that's formed and there's someone new every time and when they're new we kind of have a little initiation which is show us your collection and uh, everybody just sits there drooling on camera <laughs> like, I've, got, I've got to say the collections that our listeners have put hours to shame oh they're, they're, they're better than some museums some of the stuff and most of all you know you're supporting us and you're helping us keep independent because you look at the charts at the moment and it's kind of Lots of big names and big kind of companies and stuff behind it, but we're just free lads sitting at home, kind of having a nice laugh about retro games each week and doing great interviews. Yeah, and for backing us on Patreon, you also get the regular show um, early most weeks as well. Of course, you get it ad-free as well, and you get extra content in there. Because, you know, some people are like, well, if you take the ads out, is it a shorter show? It's not. You know, sometimes we give you like an extra 50 minutes of content in the patrons-only version as well. So if you'd like to back us on Patreon, you can head to our website at theretrohour.com, and we will give you a mention in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming, the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Like this week, a big thank you, MCSH. Ian Petz, Steve Terrell, and Reese Clatworthy, who all made donations into our Patreon. We massively appreciate that. And if you'd like to do the same, you'll find it all on our website at theretrohour.com. Now, we do have a little survey running on our website that there is still a couple of weeks left if you want to get involved in this. Um, and I've got to say, the response that we've had so far has been incredible. I think we're on almost 700 replies now which, um, you know, considering how many people actually take the time to go onto websites and fill in surveys, I think that is a pretty impressive number. Yeah, it's it's really good. And, you know, it really helps us kind of, like, pick the direction of the show because, um, you know, there's a great question that we've been looking at, which has been what systems you like and kind of what systems you own and prefer. And it's really interesting to see other systems because then we can go, oh, we can, we can aim for a guest in there, we can aim for a guest on 
that area and it's just great to hear people's different opinions of the show and you know you've got an opportunity as well we decided we need some incentives some 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 way for people to kind of feel rewarded for filling out this survey and what's better than a hundred pounds to spend on whatever you want in the retro world yeah there's a hundred pounds of cash out of joe's pocket yep straight away i knew that was coming <laughs> i don't remember saying that joe after those cans of strongbow that night you really the next on me, strongbow today. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah so re- really you know it's a big thank you for helping us shape the future of this show and these replies that we're getting were invaluable i mean every day i look through and i forward a load to um, ravi and joe and we've already come up with a few ideas based on on the replies that we're getting in these surveys. Um, and like Ravi said, I mean, you know, just knowing kind of what gaming platforms you're interested in and what we should do more shows on in the future and the things maybe not so keen on that we'll do less of, you know, that kind of thing all really helps shape this podcast for, you know, hopefully the next five years of doing it. And also there's a few, you know, advertiser questions in there that are going to help us get, you know, relevant advertisers for the podcast in the future as well. So it all really helps us out. And you could win £100 just for filling it in. Will I select someone at random? And you've got about two weeks left. If you want to do that, you'll find it on our website website at the retrohour.com now i know that ravi in particular is itching to get into the history of syndicate one of his all-time favorite games and of course from a legendary company bullfrog our special guest is the amazing sean cooper next on the retro hour podcast You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time for our favourite part of the show where we welcome on a special guest, a veteran of the video games industry. And our guest today has been behind so many incredible games that we you know, personally grew up playing and some incredible companies as well, including, of course, we're going to talk about Bullfrog today, uh, games like Magic Carpet, Dungeon Keeper, Populous, lots more as well. And of course, the main event, Syndicate. So let's welcome on our guest this week, the amazing Sean Cooper. Hello, Sean. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. It's nice, nice and warm in my room. Yeah. My little <laughs> and uh, yeah, raring to go. Really happy to be here to, to talk, uh, talk historical stuff. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I mean, while we're talking historical... Why don't we go right back to the beginning then and kind of find out where your journey began? I mean, what was kind of your first introduction into computing then? Oh God, I just, I just, I, I, I almost remember the day like, like, like it was yesterday. Uh, my dad was in the army, so we were, we were posted to Cyprus, and I had a, you know, some sort of calculator and stuff. And the, and the maths teacher was was uh, bringing along on one of these trolleys. You know, these trolleys I have in school, and it was a, yeah. it was a BBC. Micro. I'm not sure if it was Model B because it was like uh, 1981, and um, I just remember asking him, "What's um, what? What's that thing?" Because <laughs> I had no idea. What, what's that then? And he said, "Oh, it's a computer." I was like, oh, "What does it do?" He said, "It calculates, and uh, you know, you can put code on it and stuff." And I was like, "Oh, wow!" You know, and I and I think at that point, I still remember it today. You know, I think I think I just had a magnetism towards it. Um, and I helped him set it up, you know, we got it going and and it was just amazing. You know, it's just such an amazing, I think I must have gone on to my dad about a thousand times about getting one, but they were a lot of money back, you know, back in the day. Then my dad bought me in 1983, I think it was 1983, it was a BBC Model B, the, the Acorn, the Acorn computer with the 6502 chip in it. And um, I, you know, it was bought for the family, and of course, it lived in my room, um, up in my bedroom. And I just started, you know, um, I'd already sort of seen them at school, but I really started to do lots of those typings from the from the centre of magazines on that kind of recycled yellow paper in the in the middle. And I started typing out the games and then modifying them, and slowly just sort of learning how things worked. You know, recolor sprites and that kind of stuff, mostly in, in basic. And that's kind of all I knew back then. And then I wasn't really doing that well at school and stuff. I was, I was very distracted by computers. And, and I think I just had this one track mind of just, of just wanting to use computers the whole time, not to play games, but to, to write software and do, do funky stuff with them. And, and I remember the, I had the computer key at this. Um, I used to go to school in um, the West End of Woking, at, at Gordon Boys. I think it's Gordon School now, and it was a boarding school. And the computer, uh, Mr. Etherington, I think it was, he gave me the 
a computer key and kind of let me be in charge of the computer room. You know, and this was in the absence of going to chemistry and biology, and I skipped classes, and 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 I was just generally really naughty, and I would just go up to the computer room and just mess around on the computers, and they were all BBC Model Bs as well, and then eventually learned a bit of six five zero two, which then sped things up, you know, and, and and then I my ambition changed because all of a sudden I could do a bit more faster, uh, i.e., push more things onto the screen and stuff. So I was writing games for the kids at school through my year year three, year four, and year five, which I think is nine, ten, and eleven year now. Mm. Um, and you know, the weekends we used to play Elite. You know, nineteen eighty four when that came out, and that, that's pretty much you know that's, that's kind of my was my favorite one of my favorite times of you know messing around with computers. Did you have any experience of consoles as well, and uh, did you own any? I had an Atari 2600 that my dad had bought prior to that BBC B. I think it was 1980 because we took it to Cyprus with us. I had that, but I didn't really know how to program it, you know, because I was, I was quite young, right? And there's no internet, so, and there's no, there was no real resources uh, on the island of Cyprus to sort of learn, learn anything other than, well, there just wasn't the resources, right? I couldn't just go somewhere to a computer club because it didn't really exist. There was a, a, a finite number of children that were in the in the armed forces that were at school. And I just don't think they they had rat, you know run it at that point. Um, I, I'd have loved to get in got into stuff earlier, but I, I, I just didn't, you know. And I also had um, uh, I also had an Archimedes which I paid for um, with my own money, which was a, again an acorn machine with an arm chip in it. And of course, no one else bought one apart from me. Uh, I think I was probably the only one in the, the only one in Surrey with one. But that was that was an awesome machine. I actually wrote a sequencer because I used to play keyboards and stuff. So not so much consoles. The consoles came kind of later for me. And I think the Archimedes as well. I mean, it always felt like a very you know I've got a, an Acorn A thirty ten next to me actually, right. um, and it always felt like a very you know untapped platform for games as well because I mean they were education machines and it, it really felt there was a lot of power actually in there that people didn't know how to get out of it at the time generally. Yeah, exactly. And I think that people like uh, David Braben, I think he had one, and um, yeah, because I think he wrote Virus on it originally, right? Or was it Sarge? yeah Lambda, wasn't it originally? Was it? Yeah. So he wrote that on it, and um, and there was other games that were that were put onto it, but it wasn't really, it wasn't really a gaming platform. And at that point, I really, I didn't play that many games when I had the Archimedes. This is just prior to sort of going to Bullfrog and stuff. I think I really love creating stuff. And I think games just didn't, they, they just didn't have that, they, the, not like Minecraft, you know, I'd have loved Minecraft if it had come out, you know, when I was a child. You know, those kind of creative games. I just like to build stuff, right? So I spent most of my time just just coding and just trying to code, right? Because I had, again, limited knowledge, didn't go to university. Um, there was no internet. I had a couple of books. I had my, my 6502 book and my, um, and then later on the Archimedes, the ARM chip processor book. And of course, BASIC that was on both the systems. And it wasn't until I got to Bullfrog that I really could enjoy games again. Because I think there was a lapse of about two to three years in <clears> somewhere in my childhood that I really didn't get into any game between, let's say, 15 and 18, you know, the time right. I joined Bullfrog. I mean, you mentioned those magazines as well, you know, with the type in listings. I mean, which yeah. kind of magazine did you buy for that? Were you getting like Acorn User and the, the BBC yeah, Micro yeah, magazine yeah. kind of thing? Those, yeah, so those kind of magazines... Um, and I think they did one for the Archimedes as well. And I think I did a few type-ins on that. And that really, I think it really accelerates your, le- uh, you, you know, with things like, um, what's the forums, you know, or, you know, the forums for coding today, you just mm. search for something and then people, you know, there's many different implementations. The thing is we didn't have that. So the type-ins was the only thing that I could do. And, and the trouble is to make the piece of code actually be realized was to type in the whole thing. So you could actually then see what that part of the code was doing. So I used to type them in and, you know, of course, there's loads of mistakes and, and you just go back through and debug, you know, find out where they are and stuff. But that's part of the learning, right? So if you're typing something in, 
you know, bit by bit, you're constantly learning the syntax and the the way things work and different techniques. And I think it progressed my skill immensely by doing it. Well, you were on a, a YTS scheme and uh, for our foreign listeners, that's kind of a youth uh, training scheme where you're uh, like on the job and you're also learning as well at the same time. Um, how, how did that help you grow in programming and kind of prowess? I don't think it did really. Um, I think what the YTS gave me was a gateway to to get a job programming. You know, at this point, my dad's thinking this, you know, my son's a hopeless case. He's on his computer all the time in his bedroom. You know, what the hell is he doing? I got fired from a job, you know, some factory job or something. And I just thought to myself, you know, what am I going to do? And there was this, and I think this is one of the great things about, you know, the country back then is that they were really helping out the youth um, because there was a bus that used to turn up at the, um, the supermarket car park and it was like a career, a, a mobile career center. So I, mo- I went on down there because I'd seen an advert in the paper for it come in. And it was like June or something. And I was 17, right? And my birthday was two months away. And to get on a YTS, you had to be under 18. Um, so I was just scraped in to get into this YTS. And she says in Guildford, they're going to give you this much per week. I think it was like something like 24 pounds or something of, you know, so you could get there by bus. So, and that was in Guildford. And, and in actual fact, it was less than 20 meters away from the Bullfrog office. So, and it's where, um, I don't know if you know Guildford, but it's where um, bar, the drink and Mambo's was on that corner. So I used to turn up there every single day. And I used to help other kids that were in there, um, you know, 16, 17, 18 year olds. And I used to help them, uh, you know, do little projects. And um, that's where I met Alex Trowers. He was, he was in there and we were just helping out, you know, teaching these others, you know, show, showing them what things could do and this, how to get started. And I think it was one of the problems. And there weren't many teachers in there. There weren't many people sort of, you know, kind of helping. I think there was just one guy sat in an office as, as far as my memory serves. So it was very much just a place to sort of meet up and, and uh, hopefully some people, you know, would get some jobs. And eventually Peter did walk in. Yeah, I think he actually came over and met with the guy. And I think I met with him in the head of this uh, iTech um, center's office that I met Peter for the first time. And I, I can't remember. He seems to think that that's, what's hap- that's what happened because I asked him later on. And they he offered me a job. It's amazing how many people we've had on the podcast that have said that they were on a YTS scheme and then they got into the games industry. It seems to be a real kind of route of development uh, back then. Wow. Or maybe they're just stealing my story, right? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was the only one. You know, every time I, every time I tell, tell someone, it, they're like, really? You know, so... I don't yeah. think they had Peter Molyneux working in there. That would have been a bit, a bit different, yeah. Yeah, that would have been different, yeah. But they were already, you know, Bullfrog was already, um, you know, up and running, writing software. Uh, you know, I think they just started um, Populous at that point. But, he, you know, he'd, I think he'd already had a career, hadn't he, at that point. And I didn't really know much about him, and I didn't really care what, who he was or, or what it was. It, it was just someone had said do you want to come and work with us? And I thought, and it's a games company. And I just thought I didn't even realize that was an option to go and work in the games industry. I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea. Next minute, you know, my world goes from black and white into color, literally. You know, I think I've said that quite a few times to people is that, you know, you sat there programming in two colors or four colors for so long. And then all of a sudden I'm in, I'm in Bullfrog and I'm looking at the screen and it's just full of color. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, and sat there, um, you know, six months in playing, playing Populous against Peter and Glenn and Kevin and stuff, you know, testing the game. It was just unbelievable. It's like I had my eyes shut until that point. It does sound amazing, you know, a 17 year old on the YTS game going into this company then and kind of what was it like, you know, when you first joined there and what was kind of the culture like at Bullfrog? bizarre really i mean it was uh we we're up in a we we're up in a loft in um on bridge street in guildford 
um, above PJ Hi-Fi. It's right at the top. It's boiling hot up there because we're right at the top, so all the heat's going up. You know, me and Glenn are bumping chairs because there's because there's not enough space. It's just it's just unbelievably cramped. Mostly programmers. You got Kevin, um, Glenn, and Peter all programming. And there was an artist called Andy, I think his name was. And then there was me. And then Les sat downstairs. I think he was on the on the first floor, and um, he was in the coolness. I think, I think it was a lot cooler downstairs than it was upstairs. So there wasn't that many of there, there wasn't that many of us. And um, you know, Glenn was doing some. He did all the artwork for um, Populous, so most of the art was done by him. Um, I did a bit on the um, my first. I think my first commercial title. Peter went away on holiday, and. Glenn said, if you don't actually do some work, you're going to get fired. So let's make the promised lands, right? So we actually put that together. I drew a lot of the landscapes. I did the computer world. I remember that. And that was kind of my first real experience of doing anything in a team of developers on games. And it was just amazing because we because when Peter came back and he was like, well, we better get this data disk out. Oh, we've done it. We've already done it. <laughs> And it was and it was it was awesome, you know. It's just first steps, you know. Well, your first uh, game to lead was Flood as well. How, how did it feel, kind of being in control of a of a entire game? It just felt. It just. It was an. I mean, looking back on it now, it it just it just felt like um, it felt like an honour that I remember. I remember sort of Peter sort of scratching his head and going, "Sean, is this something you want to do?" And I thought, "Well, I'd love to do that, Peter. Of course, I would love to do it." And of course it did. And um, Kevin had already sort of written this, um, you know, this kind of multi-directional scrolling platform block-based uh, system. He had this sort of snake thing going up the um, around this world. It looked nothing like, you know, flood that we were doing. And I just thought, get rid of that stupid snake. That's a bit silly. And um, I think I was just really kind of blunt and blunt and rude. Um, so kill that off, kill that off. I don't know anything about, I don't think I knew anything about C and the main loop was in C and I didn't know anything about it. So I just stayed in assembler, uh, which I, th- which was the, um, 68,000 on Amiga. And I knew how to program in, 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 in assembler, right? So switching from one to the other, it's just the syntax and the commands are slightly different and you know, all of that, but it's, it's the same kind of structural s- side. And I, I wrote the game flood. We got, I think we hired an artist mid game to sort of do the artwork, you know, some brainstorming on who the main character should be. But I knew that it should be a character that stick to walls. We knew it should uh, flood up, which is what the system that Kevin actually wrote. He, he wrote that, um, the, the water flowing system. Um, and it was just, it was just amazing, you know, it, it, just unbelievable. I think I was, what, 19, 20, 19 when it was, when it was launched. Um, for my first title, I remember all my friends waiting for me in the multi-story car park opposite because we were meant to be going to Cornwall and there was a few bugs left and it's approaching midnight. And then at midnight, I went, right, that's it. I'm off. You guys finish up. <laughs> 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 you you guys get on with it. So there was Glenn there. The whole team was there, basically. And I said, I, you know, I can't wait any longer. We've got to get down to Cornwall. And I think everyone just looked at me as if to say, you scoundrel and uh, I just left the building and that was it and then the next minute it's in the shops it was an interesting concept that game as well it was like setting the sewers wasn't it and you had to pick the yeah. up and things it was where did that idea come from then I think it was the main mechanics where we 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 managed to iron out the main mechanics quite quite quickly you know sticking to walls flooding and then where should we set it right so then then there was a context someone ne- needed to do a finale scene you know, and I think we had a brainstorming session at that point. I didn't really care that it was, you know, where 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 it was set. But I did get to choose what happened at the end, and uh, he gets run over as he comes out of the sewer. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is not necessarily a good good thing to happen in games. You need you need at least a little bit of celebration. If he just gets run over. <laughs> um, you know, so I I think it was just whatever, what, wherever you can draw. Wherever you can, whatever you can draw, we'll um, we'll base it there. And it just wasn't important to me. I think the most important thing was was the game, the way the game played at that point, and, and that's the bit that I, I I was really precious about, you know, getting right. 
Well, obviously, multiplayer was quite a big deal in a lot of Bullfrog games. I mean, was it important for them to have the option in there for like more than one player? Yeah, uh, not necessarily um, from a commercial standpoint. It was more if you can play, instead of writing a computer player, if you can battle against someone else, then you can see what's good about the game and what's not. And I think that the, you know, Populous had a serial port uh, multiplayer, serial and parallel, I think. So you would connect it via a lead. That was hugely powerful when playing, when trying to tune the game. Because I think if you've got to tune a computer player and you've got to tune the game at the same time, it's it's kind of quite, it's harder to do, right? So, so if you play it multiplayer, not only are you having fun with the game that you're writing, but you can put a lot of heads on it at once to get feedback from it, right? And get opinions and, and stuff. And I think that really showed prominence in, in Syndicate, although it was a very primitive kind of net BIOS system, which only worked on LAN, LANs, I think, at the time. It allowed me to have a weekend of people coming into the office to play multiplayer games. Once we were up and running of being able to shoot another person, so you imagine you've got you've got well I think we had eight guys at the start eight um, eight little controlled characters and then you can shoot someone else right so just those basic principles of a gun firing that bullet hitting the person and killing them once you've got those principles in the game then you can have a multiplayer session on it so over being commercial with multiplayer games it was more important that we could get lots of observations from lots of people. Um, very quickly. Now, if we were to not have that multiplayer in there, later down the line, that's when people would be playing it because they wouldn't be able to play it unless you were building it to be multiplayer because you wouldn't set it up. You'd have a lot of a long development line before you could make it playable. Whereas if you think about the basics of Syndicate, of shooting another person, killing something else, you only need those base principles. So So you can do it on a flat land, with no buildings or just a few obstacles in there, one gun and the control system. I, I think like the speed of the engines uh, was really important. Like the, the games seem to be very technically impressive and kind of ahead of a lot of the competition. Um, uh, w- was that stuff hard to implement, like uh, Powermonger's engine and uh, a pop well, I, as well? Well, I could imagine that <laughs> I think Glenn would think so. I think a lot of Glenn's brilliance comes under that restriction of the fact that the system's restricted. Because nowadays, right, there's there's minimal restriction, and I think the restriction for, for for all of us back in that day of being able to do, you know, lots of things like the you know the bringing the city to life, Glenn's um, 3D um, engines, you know, Magic Carpet, Powermonger, even back to Populous, right? That was still pretty impressive from 1989 to have a, a, a modifiable isometric landscape. He, that's just where his head was. That's, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to, he wanted to create landscape games. Uh, and, and, and if you look through all the stuff he's done, they've all got, a lot of them have got <laughs> landscapes in them. Um, and I think he likes that. And they're all modifiable, you know, Magic Cup was modifiable and Proper's ma- modifiable, not so much Powermonger. But yeah, I can imagine that. Um, I, m- I imagine they were hard to do. But but if your head's there, you know, if your your head's in the game, then you're just going to keep rapping at it and still and until you get the result you want. And I think it's the same with the, it's the same with the syndicate engine. It's, it's um, not n- nothing nothing necessarily brilliant compared to Glenn's 3D stuff. But the complications that come with trying to push that many blocks onto the screen at once. It was it was hard to manage, I would say, rather than hard to hard to implement. It's hard to maintain. Would you say you guys kind of enjoyed the challenge? Because um, even even if some of the games kind of that you guys did on the sixteen bit stuff was proposed today, people would be like, "Wow, that's massively complex," or "There's so many options in there." So, kind of doing it back then, um, it might have put off some other programmers or designers. Yeah, you could call it. I mean, looking back on it, if if we was if I was setting up a company now, I th- I would have it as a number one risk, you know, the the stuff that we were that we were getting into. But back then, yeah, the the I think particularly for Glenn, the challenge 
and the challenge that and the result it was like being a rock star and releasing the album you know it, it was literally like that and stuff that he did you just look at it and go wow we can do this game in that um so it's such a lovely time to write games when all you're trying to do is push the system to its end to try and get something out of this little amount of process and power you've got and just just to be the best i guess you know to try and be the best well, what was working with Peter like, and did his ideas and concepts like really inspire the design and direction of the company? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I think I think Glenn had some sort of play in that as well, sort of visualizing certain concepts with the the populous landscape. You know, I think that was created before it was populous, right? But I think Peter's big ideas, you know, and I, th- I think recently after over the last ten years, you know, his, people are saying his ideas, you know, too big and can't be delivered and stuff. Well, he did have big ideas back then, and we did try to implement them as best we can. I think what Peter was really good at is he was really good at identifying what the key thing was that the consumer would latch on to. Well, he certainly did that for me because I would have quite a lot of meetings. You know, he'd say, "Oh, we're going to do a, you know, we've got a guy on a carpet flying around the landscape. What, you know, what should we do with it?" And I said, "Well, we're going to do this." And okay, we'll go away and do it then. And that was it. Um, and then we'd meet back and go, well, we're trying to do this and that. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And and then we just bounce ideas off each other. And I think, he, I mean, he was my mentor. So, I, I, so I'm so i very biased because he really, really did taught me how to do things. He showed, he gave me the confidence to do it. He gave me the autonomy to do it. And I could just realize and just get on with anything I wanted to get on with. And that was, you know, you'll just never forget it. You know, I have asked him recently, I said to him, uh, you know, why me? And he said, well, I saw something in you in that white, yes. And, um, you know, so, yeah, it's a great guy. It was great at my at my age to meet an individual like him and go and work with him for, you know, the next 10 years. Well, where did the idea for Syndicate come from and the kind of amazing dystopian storyline? I love the idea of people being within a, a world and then getting snapped out of it. You know, they've all got microchips in their head. <laughs> well, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a long time ago, but we had finished a game. I think it, I think it must have been Flood or Powerbunger, one of the two. We were all down the pub, and I mean everyone. Maybe Les wasn't there, but I think he might have been. But it's hard to remember, right? So, because we're going back to 1990, I would think, 1991. So I'm like 20, 20 years old at this point. I'm now 50, so it's a, it's a while ago. And we were down the pub and, and you know, all I could think about was doing, a, I wanted to do a game of guns, killing people. And I think that that was my kind of, what I was trying to put out to everyone because they're saying, well, what are we going to do next? I think everyone was bouncing around, sort of Blade Runner. There was other things, RPG type elements in there. Things, and some things I just didn't, understand at that point until until we started to develop certain things and i you know i'd seen films like the terminator and stuff and peter had said something about adjustable levels on chips and stuff and we were just chucking ideas out and then eventually i think after about six months of working on it i think we found what syndicate was going to be but mostly i think it was born down the pub and written onto a napkin and decided by the team that was Bullfrog at the time. And do you know what? I can't even remember every single person in that room. Um, the best think, ideas are always on a napkin, aren't they? <laughs> well, I think I, th- I think that the simplest ideas, right, the, the shorter the idea, they are the best, especially if everybody loves it, right? So imagine everyone in the room just goes, yeah, 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 that's what we're going to do. And that was what that's what we had. So everyone was getting drunk and then, yeah, we're going to do this. And it's going to be like, there's going to be loads of guns, and and I'm you know I'm just I'm probably shouting at this point. Yeah, I'm going to have a mini gun and killing people. It's going to be great, you know. And and, um, and then we started the work on it, and, and the rest is yeah. It's just it took a long time to do it. I think it was quite it was very complicated um, for me. I didn't really understand. Well, I, I'm not sure that you could have looked it up if it if it. I'm not sure anyone had really done it. You know, sort of having these kind of systems and games of you know trying to bring a city to life at that point and not really sure what was around 
didn't really see too much. No one placed anything on my desk that was resembling, you know, a living, breathing city. But that's what that those were the words were written up on the on the whiteboard: living, breathing city. And I remember the uh, interviews that Peter had early on, and I think they must have been Powermonger or another game. And he would go, yeah, we're working on this game. It's going to be a living, breathing city. And, you know, people are going to go to work and they're going to get in their cars and they're going to drive out to the out to the country and stuff. And this thing's going to be alive. And that's what we tried to do. We tried to make it into, into a game that, that felt alive on its own. And then these agents, these killing machines, assassins or whatever you want to call them, came in and got on with their job that they needed to do. So I remember reading the you know, magazine previews of it before it came out, like when it was still work in progress. And I remember reading that it was going to originally be a, a multiplayer game. And what kind of change there then? Well, it, it was a player just prior up to launch. And we put it into the American Revolt, so the data disc afterwards, which was too late. But I tried to keep the deadlines, you know, and we had a slot to get it into QA. I worked through the night to try and fix the problems with it. Um, and I couldn't fix it, so I cut it. I'm not sure if I told Peter or, any, or anyone, and I don't, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure it was a problem or anything. But we, I sent the disc off on the bike um, in the morning because we worked through the night. Basically, I'd just taken out from the. Um, I asked Phil. I think it was Phil Jones. He wrote the um, the kind of the front end UI stuff, and I said, just comment out that multiplayer line. Just let's get it out because it's not going to be launched with it because I can't fix it. Literally switch it off. Yeah, just deactivate the button that starts it, right? So it was still in the code. You could have, if you're decent at hacking, you probably got, you, you could have probably got in there and reactivated it. It was probably literally just an if true state, you know, if false straight statement around it, just to stop it from coming up. So it was, it was a real shame, but you know, it was only going out to a, a very limited number of people that could play a multiplayer because it was over a LAN anyway. And the game stood up on its own on in, in single player. You know, I can I must have completed it in like twenty times before we launched it. You know, just play it through and through and through and through and through again until we thought, yeah, that's um, it was really nice. It was my one of my favourite games I've completed because I didn't do all the level design right. So, so you imagine you put this, you design this game together, and then someone else designs the levels. Right, let's go and play it. And so I got to experience this game. I'd, I'd I'd worked on almost like a consumer, you know, because because uh, I didn't know what the scenarios were, half of them. I didn't design them. You know, our design team did it. Well, um, what weapons didn't kind of make the final cut? And, and when you said uh, you, you reached those later levels, there, there was a bit of slowdown in those later levels because it just got absolutely crazy. I remember one one of the later levels with just tons of agents coming and <laughs> mini guns and stuff, and on the Amiga. <laughs> that really slowed down by the end but it was worth it it was mega cool <laughs> yeah i think on the I, I i think on the pc as well there i i think it was the same we like to have busy levels and i think alex he really loved to put out the um you know get lots of agents in and, and make it mega hard and i, I think we, it was at the point where you know we didn't realize that it was too hard you know for the con the consumer it probably probably went better if it was easier and had less things in it. But, you know, who cares if it slows down a little bit, if there's massive amounts of explosions going on. I just think that's awesome. It's just it's just awesome. And then you're killing loads of these agents running at you, especially the last level, the uh, the Atlantic Accelerator. I just just thought it was brilliant. At the t You know, I was 22, and I just thought, my God, this is brilliant. This is, this is brilliant. It's going to sell loads. <laughs> Were you involved in um, Syndicate Wars at all? Because I, I love the uh, destructible buildings, the fact that everything could kind of get blown up in that game. Well, I wasn't really... I mean, I, I'd moved on to it was Magic Carpet and um, that came quick co concession, you know. That I don't really remember, because Mike Disquette was the... Um, he was the guy who, who ported the Syndicate from PC onto the Amiga. And then... After that, he I think that's when he went on to Syndicate Wars. So I didn't have too much to do with that, apart from playing it. Um, well, you mentioned uh, Syndicate American Revolt as well. Was it was there kind of a plan for Syndicate 2 um, to come out? I think Syndicate Wars was a Syndicate 2, really. 
in some ways. Yeah, it c- c- kind of was, yeah. It was, it yeah, was a follow-on um, and the storyline yeah. expanded as well, yeah. It just it just didn't feel like... Um, I think it sold more copies than said the original Syndicate as well, but the market was massively grown at that point, right? So I don't think it was necessarily um, in line with what Syndicate at, you know, actually was. And I think it was a bit too... It was a bit too pixelated, and it was in those early days when the um, camera angles were a bit, bit kind of hard to to get around in three D. Yeah, I, I think, think he, yeah, yeah, I, I struggled I think, there. Yeah, I think he had. I think Mike and um, and and the team had probably set out to do a lot more than um, the system that it was being done on. You know, could do, and 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 it, and it was probably knowledge and stuff. But that aside, right, it was a. It was a it, it was a lovely game, and we were very proud. You know, we were very, very proud of it. So it's sort of like Syndicate one point a sun, Syndicate sideways, I would call it. It's sort of, <laughs> sort of a, a sideways kind of one point five. I would have loved to have done a sequel had I not wanted to work on something original, and I think that was my main problem back then. Is that I wanted to sort of get on with a different type of game, you know, like Magic Carpet. And that's that's when Magic Carpet came in. Well, EA created a, a first-person shooter in uh, 2012. Would you like to see any any kind of continuation of Syndicate, um, uh, maybe back to its original style? Have you seen Satellite Rain, which is a kind of a Syndicate tri- tribute game? I think Mike, Mike Disquette worked on that. So the guy who wrote Syndicate Wars, I think, didn't he write Satellite Rain as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was, that, that was pretty good. Um, yeah, it's not mine, you know. It's um, yeah, I I wrote it, but EA owns it, right? So so if I was to do a Syndicate two, it wouldn't be under that that license. It would be something else, you know. So I'd love to see something, but it's kind of gone, isn't it? It's it, I think it's had its time. I think that's that's stamped in history. We'll just create something new. We're talking even you know, groundbreaking releases back then. I mean, I remember still vividly sticks in my mind seeing the early demos for Magic Carpet on games like you know TV shows like Bad Influence and Games Master, and my jaw dropping. You know those 3D graphics. I'd never seen anything like that before. Tell us a bit about kind of the background and were you guys kind of blown away by the hype and the reaction to that game? Well, I was thinking about this earlier that I think we knew it was great. I think Doom was out by now, and I I don't think it was as good as that. Um, looking you know, looking from this position backwards. But I think we thought we had something really awesome. So I think when we read, you know, I think there was an article in the magazine, Super Cooper, you know, working on this, working on this magic carpet game. And um, I just didn't think anything of it at the time. I think we just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to write the game. So I didn't really feel it, you know, is what I'm trying to say. Looking back on it, I just think it was, it was just amazing that people loved, you know, we had a lot of fans come out of, those early games that we did, you know, Syndicate and Populous and Powermonger and, and up to Magic Carpet, the, the fan base just grew and because they loved the stuff that we were doing. I, I think Magic Carpet hit at exactly the right time when people had uh, new powerful graphics cards and they really wanted to show them off. Um, it, it, it seemed to be kind of ideal for that. Did you get like a lot of access to hardware before other people? Yeah, I think we had um, we had the new Pentium in. But I do remember the the big switch from uh, from assembler code over to to C, and I think that I think Magic Carpet was the first game I wrote in in a compiler in in more of a sort of programming language rather than assembler. Yeah, so sorry, sorry, I missed um, I missed what the question was. It was just too reminiscent. Now. <laughs> no, it was, it was, it was just. <laughs> I was right back to 1994 going, God, yeah, there was all these machines delivered and and the Pentium chip was a new thing. And um, I was just kind of, oh, this is awesome. And then Glenn was like, you know, probably absolutely loving it, you know, going, oh, my God, I can, I can make the view distance so much further, which I destroyed, you know, because I, I wanted the carpet to move really fast and, uh, you know, I wanted to st- I want the scale slightly changed, and and I think still today he goes, you ruined my engine. <laughs> like this, <I'm> like, <laughs> I know, but we wrote a really good game, Glenn. You know, it's calling them up at four o'clock in the morning. Oh, something's not working, Glenn. It's definitely in your code, and you it huff and puff, and then come into the office 
sort it out, you know, 10 minutes later because he lived up the road. And so it was a great time. And, um, you know, he, I think, I think Magic Carpet was when that was like the birth of the great, the great Glenn, you know, sort of here, I, here, here he comes, you know, there's going to be some great stuff. And it, it was an amazing engine, especially in high res as well, because we had really fast machines. We could run it in high res. Um, and I think high res is 640 by what, 400, some of that. It's the same as syndicate, but you know, that was high res in high res 3d was just like, Oh my God, that's amazing. I know one other mode that it had in there was the um, anaglyph stereoscopic mode as well. I mean, was there any ever been any ideas to do like a VR version of it? Or do you think that it would be something that could work today? Like Magic Carpet in VR, I think would be an incredible experience. Yeah, not really sure about VR. It probably would be. I think if, if Magic Carpet was made today, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be the same game, would it? But it would be epic. You'd be able to see further than uh, 100 meters. <laughs> yeah, so I think, yeah, VR could... Again, I'm not. I'm not really sure about VR. It doesn't seem to me VR's, you know, going to be used in in uh, other applications other than games. It's, it just doesn't feel like. It just doesn't feel like something I'm ever going to get into. Yeah, Dan's got a PlayStation VR that he hardly uses now. So yeah, about a year ago, the last time I said. Yeah, it's a fun. I think VR's a VR's a bit of a strange one. I mean, we've been doing some. I've been doing some contracts, and we're talking about on some stuff. This is for things like military, uh, military uses and stuff. VR is is a great tool, right? Especially for uh, training and educational stuff. But I think VR in games, it's I don't know why it's not there. I can't answer all the questions. But you know, my kids went on about it for about a week, and then they shut up about it. You know, and I think if you mm. can't attract them to it. And he, he goes on about stuff all the time that, you know, he goes, oh, no, this, 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 this. And it'll last for six months until something happens about it. But VR sort of, it drifted in. I said, well, we're going to go to a show. We're going to try it out, have a look. And and he was like, yeah, I've done it now. Don't, don't need to mention it again, Dad. I kind of read a comparison that um, VR is to the video games industry, what 3D is to television, you know, something that comes along every 10 years when <laughs> they want to sell more sets or something. Yeah, I think that's, po- that's, that's possibly the case. I mean, I, I got suckered into that. Well, I wouldn't say suckered, but it was the second generation uh, 3D Sony TV. And you're right, we used it once. And then now the glasses, I mean, who would who would in their right mind to put them on to watch programs? <laughs> it, just seems, it just seems nuts. Um, but I think things like uh, augmented reality, you know, I, I things like AR, I think that's those things have more prominence. I think at the moment than than probably VR does. I don't know enough about it, you know, is is what I'm saying. But my personal feeling is that most people I'm talking to, they're not talking about VR in games. They're talking about games on screens and stuff. Well, High Octane used a kind of modified version of the Magic Carpet engine, and so did Dungeon Keeper. Uh, was there a lot of excitement at Bullfrog when kind of Dungeon Keeper started? Yeah, I think so. I th- it's hard to recollect back what to, to gauge people's excitement. You know, I I think I sort of missed a lot of those sort of things. But I remember Glenn sort of saying, "Oh, we can do this." He was excited about it, and I think from Magic Carpet to High Octane to Dungeon Keeper, he got quite excited about sort of the. Oh, I tell you what, we could do. We could, we could, we could sort of have these these blocks, you know, so where there's a landscape cell, we could put a sort of, you know, could put a block in there. We could do that. I was like, yeah, well, that's really interesting. We could, then we could add another block on top. And he was, you know, probably a bit reticent about doing that because it would cost, it would be more polygons on screen and stuff. But I think the only person that I could possibly visualize as, as someone that was getting excited about it was, was Glenn again, you know, Glenn, Glenn got excited because it, it was another, it was another sort of greatness of sort of an engine that he was writing. And I think the pro- the progression from Magic Carpet to Heart Octane and then on to Dungeon Keeper was pretty amazing. I, I, I don't think anyone else was doing that type of, that game with 3D, like uh, like Syndicate Wars. You know, we had Syndicate Wars, Magic Carpet. Was anyone else doing that on the, the Amiga and the PC? I mean, it's, it's hard to remember back, but it seemed like a very kind of unique use of it. Well, when Dungeon Keeper 2 started as a project, what was um, kind of the, the aims of that then? And did you kind of want to really improve over the original? Tell us a bit about the background on the second game. I, I remember starting on the, the original 
dungeon keeper and Peter sort of mentioned something about this game, digging walls and stuff. And, and I was concepting this thing out. I think I left Bullfrog shortly. Uh, this is before dungeon keeper was, was done. No, not a lot of people know this, but I had a year out of, uh, you know, after the acquisition of EA in 1995, I left in 96 midway through. And then I came back, uh, on the premise to do dungeon keeper two. Um, I think Peter had gone off to do Lion. He had started up Lionhead at this point. And I came back. And to me, in, in, in my opinion, I think Dungeon Keeper had missed, had missed something. And that's what, that's what done, that's what I was trying to do with Dungeon Keeper 2. I think me and Peter might have had a little bit of an argument about that at the time that I thought it was one thing and he thought it was another. And that's probably why he took it away from me. And he went off site to his house to go and write it with his team. So Dungeon Keeper 2 was really my vision of what I think I would have done if I'd done the Dungeon Keeper, the original. So I wanted a lot more sort of, you know, this kind of tower defense thing that came in, you know, 10 years later, you know, these magical things that would have a lot of automation. So there was a lot more action going on. So we wanted to sort of elevate that kind of, not just have a few heroes turn up, but like have an army of heroes turn up. And that was kind of the premise behind Dungeon Keeper 2. Another game ahead of its time, that was. Was it? Yeah, yeah, I really, I really liked the Dungeon Keeper series. I remember when that came out and I was like, oh, hmm. that, that, that really feels like Bullfrog. You know, it had that kind of... Yeah. The, yeah, well, we had a lot of vibe, fun. You know. We had a lot of fun. I mean, Dungeon Keeper 2, again, you know, all of these games... Yeah, I can't remember one moment when I wasn't having a good time. You know those things that you do, you know, you, you go away on holiday somewhere and there's a there's a bit of a bad experience on one of the days when you're in holiday, it's rained or something, and, you're, and that's the bit you can focus on. You know, the whole time of writing all these games, well, for me, in my little world, it was just fun on. You know, I get my mates in to play them and, and uh, you know, you, almost forcing them no we're not going out tonight we're staying in it's saturday night we're going to be playing this game and you know i'd give them a treat or something i'd buy another type of multiplayer game we'd play that for a bit and then force them into the playing these games we just had you know it's just my childhood dream looking back i didn't know it at the time but it's like a dream come true you know just sat there doing something that you absolutely love doing you're creating awesome games with awesome people <laughs> it was just brilliant it's just i can't bring it into words right i cannot bring it into words how it how it really felt going through that period of my life well what was your ultimate kind of favorite project there and uh, what are you working on nowadays i think syndicate by far it was quite it was quite long you know two and a half years i think and you know 20 years old releasing it when, when i'm 22 and i worked every single day, almost with a couple of nights off and wasn't any holidays in it. And I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. I learned how to do so many things. I learned different types of programming languages, you know, like C and stuff and, and just had great people around, you know, it was just, it was just unbelievable. And then on to now, you know, I've been, um, I sort of left EA in 2005, went off to the flash, flash game stuff, did quite a lot of stuff quite a lot of games there worked on a game called um uh, boxhead which sort of went out onto most uh game portals and again i had just a really good time programming that lots lots and lots and lots of techniques from syndicate just all wrapped up in it with a lot of new kind of learned techniques and then the flash market ends you know we moved to mobile um, doing a bit there and then i've taken some time out for myself from I think 2013, my wife wanted to start a business. So I spent five years with her making this big shop in uh, the town that we live in um, and helping out other people who want to hit the high street with products. Um, so we rent little tiny little spaces for startups. And then I had my five years off and um, I s contacted the um, executive producer on Dungeon Keeper 2, Colin Robinson, and said, do you fancy doing something with me? And then um, bumped into Glenn, which I was always bumping into anyway. And, but I just, we just had, a, I just had an idea that we should remake Populous. 
so we started down that kind of road exploring that and then what what we've ended up with is we've ended up with this kind of it's kind of a world building so you basically without giving too much away you kind of create your own earth with all your own animals on it and experience sort of natural disasters and all sorts that's what we're trying we're sort of currently pitching at the moment which you know i think um i don't i can't see that being too far away uh, because we're we're now sort of we're on our kind of third third pitch line we've only been running it for a couple of years um these things take time it's a really good concept um i probably haven't sold it enough there but there's a lot of like you know coming out of the um the, the game and execs so um, watch this space and um in five years time we'll have a game out I mean, having you and Glenn working on it, I mean, you know, I've got every faith in you both. It's going to be incredible. Yeah. Um, Sean, it's been absolutely amazing talking to you for the last hour. And uh, thank you for coming on and having a little uh, trip down memory lane with us and sharing some of your stories. Oh, thanks for having me. I think um, I've absolutely, I've, <laughs> at moments, I've just frozen because I'm like, oh, my God, this is just, it's brilliant. Just trying to think back, you know, those moments that I <laughs> just sat at this desk and um, having, having the time of my life. It's, so thanks. Thanks for inviting me. 